Come on. <clears throat> Can you tell me your first, your full name? Right. Give me your full name, and where and on what date were you born? My name <coughs> is Helen Drexler Zim. I was born in Lodz, Poland in 1924. Tell me a little bit about your parents yeah. and about Jewish life in Lutz before the rise of Hitler. Yeah. When, uh, Lodz was a, the second largest city in Poland. It was a very vibrant city, a lively city, a, a lot of culture and beauty we had. I was very young and uh, my, I lived with my loving parents my mother's name, Regina, and my father's name, Solomon, and I have two sisters who are alive, Nana and Halina. We had a wonderful life, a very carefree life. I went to, we were well off. We had a big business, a wholesale business, and also a soap factory. And I even remember now the, the name of our factory was Polska Wytwórnia Medlarska. That means a, a factory, Polish factory of soap. And it was not a common place that people have telephones. But we were well off and we had a telephone and I remember our telephone number which was 19318. I was very happy and I was going to, to gymnasium. Not too many people could afford to go to gymnasium because in Poland you have to pay for, for high school. But being well off as we are, my father sent me to high school, to a gymnasium. And what my father mean? was a very modern person. And, and, and they, they, these times he believed that a woman should be as well educated as a man. He was really before, before his times. I had a, I remember I was going to a private Hebrew school. The only women were attending the, the, that school. I remember our professors were very, very, very lovely professors, and I loved that school. I enjoyed going to it very much. I had a lot of friends, acquaintances, and everything was going beautiful. Ex what, what about anti-Semitism? I felt sometimes, see, we lived in Lodz, in a, in a very Polish section. And I didn't account as much anti-Semitism. But when it was the beginning of the war, like in 1939, I remember they used to write, there was a big letters on your on, on you business that say, don't buy from a Jew. Nie kupuj u Żyda. That means don't buy from a Jew. There were already a lot of antisem they showed a lot of anti-Semitism. Do you remember when this first appeared on your business? Yeah, that was before the, right before the war, this appeared on the business. But when the war, no, you even ask me something. What about daily life? What was daily life? What was Jewish life like? I was very young. I, I had a wonderful life. You know, we go, went to school. What did I know? I was, and I was, I, I went to school, I told you, and I was very, spoiled at home, I never did anything. We had uh, uh, two, uh, two people who worked for us. One was a maid at home, and we only have another, uh, a, a sister, two sisters worked for us, and the other sister worked in the business. I never did anything in my life, and I was, I just began to experience the beauty of life. My life was cut down like you cut down a, a blooming rose. Everything was shedded when the war broke out, September, September 1939, everything changed for us immediately. We couldn't go to school anymore, which was devastating. And the Germans, every other day, they had an, another announcement for, to, to people to do. We, the other thing which was very dehumanizing and very sad, when they asked, every Jew had to wear a Star of David. That was the rule. That means he d d d means you were, the, you were not the same like everybody else. Do you remember when you first got the Star of David? I remember that I got it. Can I you was, tell me about that? I was very ashamed. 
I felt badly, I felt very ashamed that wh what is wrong with me and I have to wear this. But we had to do and then after that, we couldn't go to school and after that, we couldn't go out at night, they wouldn't allow you to go out at night. They, what they did, they kept dehumanizing you or doing all the time something else that being dehumanized you all the time. And my father was a very brave person. And when the, uh, the Germans uh, attacked Lodz, it didn't take him very long to, to come in. They were bombing a little bit. I remember we were hiding in the shelters. And after two, three days, the Germans were there. Then my father says, no, we're not going to stay here in Lodz. We're going to go to Warsaw. Because the Warsaw is, uh, you know, the, the capital of Poland. And, and, and the Polish, the, you know, the Poles, and the army and, and, and what is going to defend Poland. They're not going to give it up just like gave up Lodz. And imagine this idea that was an, an incredible idea. We left our whole store, the business with our maid, he entrusted to her, and we only had, and we, he gave us uh, like a knapsack, just a necessity of life. And you wa went walking to Warsaw. It's unbelievable. It was terrible at the time, but. We were walking, and it was a terrible time for us, because at the same time we were walking, all the army was walking, uh, the going to the, the defend, uh, defend our uh, uh, this city, the Warsaw. And there were a lot of around, there were the, the Germans were bombing terribly in the daytime. And every few minutes we had to ha hide ourselves. Little, we were just young kids, I was 14 years old. We had to hide every minute in the ravines, and every minute they're bombing us. And, and I've seen people, uh, you know, horses all dead around us, fires around us. It was a terrible sight. We walked and walked a few days. And at night, we rested. And one night, we, uh, it was very quiet. It was like an unbelievable silence. We slept OK. And then in the morning, we said, something is not right. Was too 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 silent, too quiet. Got up in the morning. We couldn't believe our eyes. In front of us, they're standing these murderous Germans. I never forget these these horrible people. These people on the motorcycles. They came around to us and they, they said, "Who are you?" We said, "Here, you better go right back. We are we already we are almost. We got into Warsaw. You have no business going back there because everything is taken." But he says, you, uh, do any, are any Jews around with you? We didn't say anything. He says, you know what? All the Jews are being killed. They're going to go like that. They're going to kill him, like you hang him up. And what they did, the next thing what they did, they took away all the, the men. And the, they, uh, they arrested all the men. Uh, and they made them a uh, uh, civilian war, P uh, the POWs, civilian Prisoners of, uh, of, you know, the prison, the civilian prisoners. They took away our father, and we began to walk back ourselves. We walked back. We came to Lodz, to our city. Luckily, nobody took nothing away from us. Nobody touched our business, thank God. But what we do now, we, had, we want to find our father. We looked around. The, the, we said, what, what, do, what happened to, this, to the civilian men who were taken? That we we found out that there was a, a big uh, announcement of the names who were, who were you know the people were taken, and now we were looking all over. And luckily, I found my father's name. I was I was very brave when I, being that young. I can't get over. And we I and on, next to the name was written down where he is, when he's being kept. Then what I did, my being the oldest. My mother said, you go, and I went, I went to uh, liberate my father. I couldn't, you couldn't do nothing in Poland without a birth certificate. I, I got his birth certificate. I went on a train, and I brought my father back. Thank God he came back. How did you get him out? Because they didn't give, they didn't do you, they didn't make too much fuss. They just, just wanted to protect themselves, but they didn't really make too much fuss about it. When you came there and you had the birth certificate, they, they, they let him go. This is where? That was in, in, uh, in Krakow, in Poland, you know, 
two, three hours away from, from, uh, from our city. I brought him back. We were very grateful and very thankful. But my father said, you know what? He said, we're not going to stay in Lodge. He said, nothing, we won't stay here. I feel that it's go, it's, it looks like the situation is getting very, very bad. And I think that we have to do, we're going to leave the city. I know you love it very much. You have wonderful memories here, but I don't think it's a good idea. Across the street where we live, there was a German, a German who lived in Poland. You call these people Volkdeutschen, and they were like, the, when after the war, the Nazi took over, they were favorites, you know, they had a lot of rights, and they could do anything to anybody, whoever they wanted, because they, have, they felt a lot of, they were powerful. My father said, no, it's not good. And what we, dis my father was talking to my mother, and they decided, to leave, to leave our, our you know, city. What was so terrible about, the Germans begin to liquidate and, can, and confiscate all the Jewish businesses. They took everything away from us. I was, the, all our possession was taken away from us, and we became poor overnight. But a decision is a decision. He says, that this is really what we're going to do. We decided to go to a small town, Zharnov, which my, I knew very well because I used to go there on vacation. Where uh, was that? Zharnov. What big city was it next to? Bi not too far from Lodz, not very, f between Lodz and Warsaw. And we went to that city. What, help, what else happened to, the, to your town? No. As the occupied no, wait a minute, I have to tell you. When, when we went to, to, to Zharnov, it was very, very sad. When we came in there, we couldn't afford to, we lived in a beautiful, when we lived in, in Lodge, we, we, we had a beautiful place with all the conveniences, and we lived in, we lived in affluence. When we came to Zharnov, we didn't have any money. We, we were broke, definitely broke. The only thing we could afford was just a one big room. Can you imagine coming from affluent and going in one room? That was, that's what we po possessed, nothing else. We were in one room and two beds and the, the other necessities. We, now for the first time, the three sisters slept in one bed and mom and dad slept in another bed. It was very difficult, it was very hard to, to get used to these bed conditions. It was a big adjustment. But you'd be surprised what you can get adjusted when you have to. But my, then we, how are we going to survive? We didn't have no money, we were broke. My father was thinking all the time, he, he think, thankfully he remembered the formula of the soap, how to make soap. And ge guess what? In that small little uh, room, we even made soap. And because of that, that's making that soap help us to survive. We were making the soap and my mother was a, a, a good businesswoman and she used, used to go out on the market twice a, a week. The Poles, the peasants used to come to the small towns. They used to bring, you know, eggs and butter and all these things, and used to exchange the soap for the, for the, for the necessity. For, this way we helped us to survive. But, we, but the times were very bad, and many times we went to, to, uh, went to sleep hungry because we didn't, have time, we didn't have too much to eat. But it was commonplace. It was war. We used to get, get some letters from um, Lodge. I forgot to mention, uh, when I think that uh, about what our decision of the going to Lodge was a very smart decision, because as soon as we left our city, Lodge, they erected a ghetto, you know, a ghetto in, uh, in our city in 1940, and they all the Jewish people, they herded in the ghetto. And many of them, a lot of people died, and many of them died in camps. And I don't think that we will be really survive. But when we lived in, more, uh, in a small town, we had a more chance of survival. Because when we lived in a small town, they didn't have no ghetto. We, every one of us had to wear a Star of David. But we didn't have to, I mean, the time were bad because it was, we were, was poverty stricken, and we didn't have no, no, but nobody was beating us, and, and it was not as bad as would have been in a ghetto. 
we stayed in, in the uh, town in the Jarnov until 1942. The time were bad, but we were very grateful that we've been together. And we received letters from our friends and from family from, from the ghetto. And they wrote to us, you know what? We are being, we are being evacuated and resettled in labor camps. They're taking us away and sending us to, to labor camps. My father says, never happens. I don't believe they're sending the Jewish people to labor camps. Can you believe that? They're sending the Jews to die, he said. And that, can you believe this tremendous force out of a person? He said, I'll do everything in my power that my, my children won't die. That was, that was his mission in life. He, did, he says he's going to do it because he somehow didn't trust the Germans. That they, he said, how come? They're sending them away. You don't hear anymore from them. That means something, is, something very tragic is happening to the Jewish people. And that night we stayed in the little small town, our small town, when our grandparents lived there, and my uncles and aunts, we used to see each other. It was very nice. It was still wonderful because we were together in, in a family. They, what was happening, the Germans were very well organized. First, what they did, they got rid of, of the big cities. And then they got to the smaller cities. When they, when they were trying to uh, persecuting the Jews or exterminate them, they did it very, in, in a very good order. They did everything just so and so. They are the best organizers in the world. They brought into our city, small city a lot of people from different small towns. And they put them together. When people were five, they put them 10. And luckily, in, in, in the typhus, there was a terrible epidemic of typhus because they put so many people in the same room. The people couldn't, the dirt and, and, and poverty all together, the people got sick. But luckily, we didn't have any more. Only the five of us stayed in one, which was very, we were very grateful. 1942 was the, was the so-called the final solution. I, you probably know what that means. The final solution was a very, the 42 was a very bad year because the Germans decided to exterminate the Jews and they had a definite plan how to do it. How did you know that? I didn't know, I didn't know it, but I know now. I want to know, Helen, more about what your experience was like in that little town. That's right. Because your experience, see, I, the history books will tell what happened overall, but they won't tell about your life. I need to know about your life. This is one example of what life was like during Nazi occupation. So in this small town, when the five of you were living in that one small room, small room tell me what was life like and what was Jewish life like in that town? Don't you see that that was a very, uh, you know, I, as I told you before, the times were very hard, but we still, you know, we used to go out on dates with other boys, Jewish boys. We used to, you know, used to date and we the used Nazis, to see each other. The Nazis didn't come into this town. They were there, but they, what, see, in every a little city, the Nazis were exceptionally well organized. What they did, they established a little Jewish center. They did their part. The, the, the Jewish people, the, the leaders got together. They have uh, some Jewish leaders who were in charge of the center, and then they had police. Every single day they came to the Jewish center and they give them orders. Today I want you to deliver to me 20 people, 30 people. I want them to work in different places. And every day they took some people. They, they didn't touch the women, but mostly the men. They had to go work work uh, in different uh, in different places, like uh, build build roads and build electric power different every day they had to do something else they took him every day they, they picked them up and they brought him brought him back home this all was was fine there was not so, so terrible we we're still very grateful because the times were very bad and we heard that people are being uh, uh, evacuated from lodges is being um, resettled and we are very grateful that we stayed but in 1942 when, when it came, the times were very bad. The dead times came to our city also. How? How? The, 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 we had some friends who were in police. They, some of them are boyfriends. And they came to us and told us, you know what? 
we, I want to let you know about something. In two weeks, Zharnov is being resettled. They're sending you to labor camps. Your boyfriend, Jewish or non-Jewish? Oh, all the Jewish. We didn't assert he was non-Jewish. No, it was not such a thing in non-Jewish. Everybody was Jewish. Nobody was not. We'd be only associated with Jewish people. When he told us that, my father got very panicky. He said, oh, God, what am I going to do? I have to do something to save the life of my children. He knew that uh, this is not resettling. He knew with his great force of the wisdom, he says, no, they're sending all the Jewish people to die, and I'm going to do everything in my power. They won't do it. He was thinking day and night, what is the other way to save our lives? The only way is that we saved our lives, we can pose as Gentile. When you had a birth certificate, that means you had a passport to life, provided you, lo you look like a Gentile. What does a Gentile mean? The German used established that. You have to have blonde hair and blue eyes and don't have any body language. Or certain people have body language. They give themselves out as Jews. And, and somebody told them, there is a guy in our city who is giving, making false identification cards. My father got very excited. He said, oh, God. He got some money. He went to that guy. He made a date with him. He said, I'm going to meet you, and I want you to give me three birth certificates. He, he knew deep, deep in his heart that was not a chance for him to survive because it was very difficult for a man to survive. The German pulled down your pants and you were a Jew. They couldn't do it. With, my mother was a sickly lady. He knew he couldn't help it. He went to, <clears throat> to that guy. He brought him some money. Do you know what his name was? No. No, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I know. Maybe Tomaszowski, I'm not sure. Anyway, guess what? He went to him. He didn't give him nothing. He took the money away from him. He didn't give him anything. When my m father came home, he was devastated. He says, I said, you can never trust the Paul. He says, don't you trust the Paul. I gave him my money. He never gave me nothing in return. But he was devastated. But he, thank God, never gave up. He said, what, uh, what is the other way? He knew a lot of people. He was, he was a leader in, in the community. Many people knew my dad, and he knew some Gentile people. My father was so determined for us to survive. And he was so broad-minded, so much ahead of his time, that he didn't mind even to find a man that I would live with. He didn't care. I could live with it, but as long as he can save my life, that's all what matters. He did, the only thing he cared that we should survive. That's the only mission he had in his life. Like a strike of luck, he knew a lady, her name is Mrs. Kazusek, a lovely woman. He befriended her and talked to her and said, Mrs. Kazusek, you know, I know you have a daughter, my daughter's name, like you know, Helen's name. Would you, I give you some money. Would you please sell me some birth certificates? I said, that would be a wonderful thing of you to do. I'll be forever grateful. That lady was a, what I call a righteous Gentile be, because she did a beautiful deed. She, she did a great mitzvah. She got some money, but the point, at the same time, she endangered her whole life to be able to help us. This was like a, a miracle of miracles. You have to recognize these righteous people who do, who do good. They're still good people in this world. Thank God for them. What happened, she brought in one night two birth certificates, and she came in and she says, and she says, I, and she looked at my middle sister. She says, I can give you, I, she has two, but me and the oh, younger, Salina, I can give her no certificate because she has a Jewish look. She really didn't have a Jewish look, but in her eyes she had a Jewish look, and she wouldn't give her no birth certificate. My father, in desperation, said, do I have a choice? He said, okay. He was grateful, and we made a date. The next day, she's coming to us. She's going to pick us up at night, and she's going to take us to Warsaw, to her own mother. Her mother lived in Warsaw. And I never forget that, that night when she came to us, and she brought in the birth certificates, and I said, for the, I said goodbye to my parents. I embraced him. I knew I'd never see him again. I, I had a feeling that I'd never see him in my life. I don't know why. But my father's 
mother said, I know you brave, and with God's help, you survive. But you, you re realize one thing, that you are going a very, in a very hostile world. Beware of people, said, and don't try not to trust the Poles. He said, because you know what happened to me, what happened to me with that Paul who did it. I think his name was Tomaszowski. He disappointed me so much. He said, you have to be very careful. Don't trust that much. Don't ever reveal your identity wherever you are. Don't you ever tell him who you are. You have to be, be careful because we're living in very bad times and the war is, is very dangerous. People sometimes doing, doing very bad things you don't know. In order to be safe, the best thing, don't ever reveal your identity. And he also told us something else which was inscribed in my brain. He told me one thing, remember, I have a feeling with God's help that you survive because you're strong and brave. He gave us a lot of courage, he said. But that when you survive, you have two aunts who lived in Toronto, Canada. As soon as you survive, you let them know and they were going to help you out. And this really, this really helped. This really happened. This is the, the middle sister. Now I have to tell you, when we came, uh, when we went, that woman uh, uh, went with us on the train. My father gave us just put some money in the back of our, our coat. That time was around September, around Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. The Germans always doing everything on uh, the Jewish holidays. holidays they're always trying to defy the Jews. They show them the Jews, the Jewish God is not a God. He is the God. He is the master, not the Jewish God. He always, the biggest atrocity committed on the Jewish holidays. Around that, that, this happened around the Jewish holidays. When, the, the, when she came to pick us up, she, she took us at night when it was dark because I was scared to death. I went with my sister and we went on a train and I was shivering, cold and, and scared. I was scared to look at anybody's faces, that somebody's going to be recognized me. I never was scared of nobody. The Poles I was scared, not the, not the Germans. And the, and the next day, we came to Warsaw to that Mrs. Kazusa's ma mother, a lovely lady. She was also a very poor lady. She was, she, was not, she was not a person of means, I can tell you definitely. We walked in, in the room. She lived in one little room in the kitchen, in the kitchen next to her. We came in, we were very grateful, and we stayed with her together for a few days. And I remember the four of us slept on one bed, and we had a bunch of bugs. You know what <laughs> bed bugs are? You know what they are? God, they bite you to death. I couldn't sleep all night, they were so horrible. I was, all night I was, I was scratching myself, I couldn't sleep at all. <laughs> we stayed with that lady, and then all of something wonderful happened. We hear a knock at the door. My sister comes in. My middle sister came in, like, like a miracles of miracle. She came in, and she told us what really happened to my parents. It's a very sad story. She said uh, when they rounded up, uh, it was a Monday. They rounded up all the Jewish people, and they told them to all have to. They have to all run down and they have to show up on the big market. They're all the Jews. Do you remember the date of this? Then September, I don't know. Sometimes September, I don't know, remember exactly. The end of September, I think. Because we, we went beforehand and don't you see? She stayed a, a few days more. And she said when they rounded up all the Jewish people she was looking, that was something terribly thing that happened. The Germans came in at the homes. And they shot people like when they seen all the person, he shot them in front. There was a lady who just had a baby. He shot the baby in front of the mother. And he said, Arouse, get out. Get out on the, on the market. You have to be there. We have to, uh, you're going to work. But my father always defied the Germans. He never went on the market. It's unbelievable. He refused to go give in to the Germans as long as he could. He never went on the market. He went with my sister and my mother and another couple, the, uh, uh, tailors also, nice, lovely people. I knew that it was a lovely couple, uh, couple and they decided to hide in a, in a barn. They were hiding in a barn for two nights. Next night, all of a sudden, somebody 
heard voices. Some boys were grazing the kettles on the side in the morning, and they opened the, the barn, and they said, look at here, Jews, zidi, zidi are here. They brought the police, can you imagine? These young kids, young children, why would they do this? He says, the Jews are here. You should be, you should be been awakened, evacuated. You don't belong here. Your sister told you this. The sister told us. Your sister with them when this happened? That's right, my sister, listen what happened. He, he took him to rouse, the policeman took him out, the whole, my, my father, my mother, my sister, and the family. But my father were well known in, in the, you know, well known in, the, in our city. He was a leader. The police knew him. And the police, told, my father told him like this. He said, I beg of you. I said, Mr. Stanislavski, something. Don't do anything to me. Kill me. I don't care. I already lived my life. I want you to spare my little girl, spare my daughter. Somehow, by miracle, they didn't touch my, my father. They turned away, and they let him go. Then they begin to walk. Where did they go? It was, begin, that was already uh, you know, late, late September. The, the days are getting shorter. In Poland, the weathers are cold. And they, what they decided to do, they decided to go to the forest, to hide in the forest. Because my father heard that they have a lot of partisans, you know, resistance already forming in these little forests. He said, maybe I have a chance. I joined these partisans. Maybe I have a chance of life. What happened? He walked and walked and walked. Unfortunately, in this part of, 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 um, of Poland, they were not partisans yet. They were not there. There was another part. My father walked and walked, and all of a sudden, it was dark, and they were cold, freezing. They didn't have nothing to eat. They were starving. And all of a sudden, my father lost my mom, and he began to cry. Regina, my mother probably was, was sickly. She, she didn't want to go no more. He had to leave her. My sister told me that. And he had to go on. With my, uh, you know, with the people, go on, walk again, walk again. Another uh, wonderful thing happened. While he was walking in the forest, he met met another lady who, who uh, also lived in, in Jarnov. She owned. She was a, a very capable woman. I remember her very well. She survived the war. She survived the war, and a gentle helped her. She. He asked her, where are you going? She says, I'm going to Warsaw. He said, what, how wonderful, see? He said, you know, my daughter is here. Would you please take her to Warsaw? I beg of you, take her to Warsaw. But don't you dare harm her. He, she's, she was always very sickly. He said, don't you harm her. Take care of her. I gave her the address where her sisters are, and she's going she's gonna to meet her sisters. Go. And she, it, it happened like that. She helped her to come, and she came to us, the, my sister. So now all three of you are together. They were all three of us together. And I was very grateful that we were all were together. I was very thankful. But I knew deep down in my heart, and being the oldest, I had a lot of responsibility. And I told my sisters, we can't be together no more. Now it's a time for us to part. Together is beautiful, but we can never survive together. We have to separate. In order to survive, everybody has to uh, find his own destiny in his own way. That's a very sad part, but that's this what, what to do. Told your sisters. That's what I told my being the oldest. I told them, and I didn't worry about myself. Being the oldest, I have the responsibility about, like my father had the responsibility above them. And that lady who we, wa we stayed with, she says, I said to her, "Do you know anybody uh, by any chance who needs some help? You know." <laughs> She says, yes, I know somebody. I said, I don't, wor don't worry about me. Just, just help my sisters. She got a job for my uh, youngest, Halina. She worked for the store. She was very lucky. She worked in the And my other sister worked for a Polish polic policeman. They had both, <coughs> excuse me, they both had jobs. And I was very thankful. I was grateful they had jobs. I was relieved. But the, and I couldn't stay in Warsaw. Why? 
because the, the, the daughter of the lady, Mrs. Kazuset, also was working in Warsaw, and we had two birth certificates, and two people could never stay in the same city. I had to leave Warsaw. Then I, what do I do? I was frantic. I said, God, what am I going to do with my life? Where do I go or where I turn? But something came to my mind. I went on the train station. I don't know, it was a, a quite, I think, a good idea. <laughs> I have to say so. Right. That was a good idea. Yes. I went on a train station, and that, and that was a date when all these peasants are coming to big cities, like they come to small cities, and they're selling their ware. They sell, they bring the eggs and the cheese and, and the butter and the geese and everything to bring in to sell it. I walked on the station, and I came to a, a, a lady, and I walked around, walked around. There was a woman, I thought it was, she looked, uh, she had a, a good face. I don't I was wrong. And I walked over, I said to her, you know, I told her a story, I made up a, a nice story. I said to her, you know, I, my father is a great patriot. I said, my name is Nusha Kazusek. My father is a great patriot. He doesn't want us to work for the Germans. He rather for us to work for the Poles. That's why I, lived my, I left my city. She liked it. And I said, besides, you know what? I know how to make soap, and I teach you how to make soap. Your life maybe is going to be much more comfortable and better because that's what we made a living. Thanks to making the soap, the formula, I, she says, really? She seemed to be very interest, interested in my story. I said, where, are you live, where do you live? She says, I live in Miwosna. I said, I said, where is Miwosna? She says, 20 miles away from Warsaw. I was very interested because I couldn't live in Warsaw. I was very thankful and I said to my said to my Shema is through. I said, oh, God, you're really looking out for me. We got into the train and I listened. I remember what she told me, Warsaw, and I listened very well what the conductor was telling us. Every station he announces where we are. He says, me was now, I got out of the train first. I got out of the train, I look for the woman. What do you think? She disappeared. I couldn't find her. I said, God, that was Christmas time. Cold outside, bitter. The whole day I was already being hungry. I walked, I said to her, what in the world am I going to do? What do I do? I don't know what to do. I only had the birth certificate. That was not enough. You, to, uh, you have to have a Kent card, that means you have a picture on the beside, but I didn't have a chance to get it yet. <laughs> then I, I walked from one house to another, and I opened the door, I knocked at the door, and I said, you know, uh, my name is Nisha Kazusek. Would you please take me in? I beg of you. It's cold outside. I'm freezing, I said, and I'd like to help you. I only, I, the only thing I ask of you, please give me shelter. I would sleep on the floor, just give me shelter. She says, no, she, she wouldn't take me in for nothing. I was going from one place to another and to another, and nobody wanted to take me in. I was almost beside myself. I said, what is my alternative? I knew when nobody's going to take me in, I have to go to the sheriff, and sheriff may be suspicious of me. I didn't feel that I am that secure, don't you see? That would be, I thought that's going to be the end of me. I'm sure he's going to, he's going to study a Jew and he's going to report me to the Gestapo. But like God is always looking out for you when you least expect it. I was walking from one place to another and I have seen a small light. There was a tiny store in the little city. Mjolsna was a small town. <laughs> I opened the door, I walk in the door. I couldn't speak anymore, but I cried. I began to sob. I cried bitterly. I said, I am so, I am so, I'm freezing. I'm by myself. I'm alone. I said, would you have mercy on me? Uh, Jesus, please. I said, Jesus Christ, have a mercy on me. I mean, I was wearing a big cross. I said, have mercy on me. I said, take me in. I said, I see that you have a story. And I, I noticed she has two children, adorable children walking around. I said, it's Christmas time. I said, you and I'm going to help you with your children. 
and, and I'm going to help you to, set, you know, in the kitchen I do everything in the world you want to do. I'll be, I'll be helpful to you. She felt very sorry for me. She was a wonderful woman. She was, she was like an angel of, from heaven. She took me in. That was like the greatest breakthrough in my life. What was her name? Her name was Mishimańska. Very lovely woman, wonderful. God, she should really go to heaven. She took me in for the first time in months. She let me, I slept on a nice bed covered up with a white sheet. No bugs were biting me. And I was slept all by myself because all this time I slept, slept with my sisters at, in that room, in that small room, in this terrible condition. And I was forever grateful to her. She was wonderful to me, very soft-spoken, very, very lovely woman. And she has two children. I took care of him. And I was helping her to, uh, to cook. And I went to, to midnight mass because, you know, I was a Catholic. I went to midnight mass because uh, I remember very well uh, when I went to midnight mass, I was kneeling almost so many hours that my knees were almost swollen from, from kneeling. <laughs> I knew all the prayers and, you know, the, nobody, she never was suspicious of me that I was Jewish, but I would never reveal nothing to her that that, that was the case. How long did you live there? I stayed with her for a few months, not that long. She decided, she says, you know, Nusha, she says, I like you very much, but I don't think I need you, she says, anymore. I don't need you anymore. Christmas is over, and the times are not so good, she says, and I think that I'd like for you to leave. I need... So you're with that, this woman for a few months. Right. And now she says to you... I, I can't. I don't need you anymore. Does she have a husband? She had a husband and children. And she told me she doesn't need me. I was very upset. I said, why not? She says, but don't worry, Nusha, she says. You don't have to worry about it. I find you another place. You can stay with some other people. I didn't have no other choice, and I was very thankful. She did find another lady who I stayed with. I remember she was an, a nice lady, but she was not very, she was poor, and not, she didn't have too much. And I stayed with her. She was like an old maid, I remember. She was a seamstress, seamstress. I was helping her to sew a little bit. But she, she had a hard time herself. But she, whatever she had, she shared with me, which I appreciated very much. I stayed with her a while and I didn't have too much to eat. As a matter of fact, I didn't even menstruate because I was undernourished. That well, means I got sick. I had to go to the doctor. The doctor, I said, how come? The doctor told me, you know what's happening to you. You are undernourished. That's why you don't menstruate. How old are you now? That was from 1942. Uh, uh, from uh, 14 to uh, 17. And I stayed with that lady for a f also a few months, and I was very happy, and, and then I left her. What happened? How come you left her? No, I didn't. I, 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 you know, I, I, call, I went to another lady, you know, that from this uh, store, and I said, do you have another place I could stay? She said, as a matter of fact, I have another place, she says. This particular lady is, is very nice. I have a picture of that lady. I told you that I have a picture of her and the baby. She says, she is very well off. Her husband is a butcher. I said, God, he, I'm, I'm, gonna plan it. I'm not gonna be going to sleep hungry like I did before. I, I was very happy about it. And I went, her name was P Mrs. Piasecka. She was very nice to me. She's lovely to me, sweet as can be. He had a little beautiful baby boy, but she lived on the second floor. And I have, to, I have to work very hard, and I was undernourished. And I had to carry the, uh, the water from the well on the second floor. That was very difficult for me. I had trauma, tremendous backaches from it. But I, was, you know, but I was grateful that I stayed with her. I, d I didn't have no other choice, and she treated me very well. And I, stay, and I was very happy with her. How long did you stay with her? I stayed with her for, for quite a while. I stayed with her from uh, 1942 until ni the end of 1943 almost, or, or even longer. She's, she was very nice to me. 
and I was forever thankful to that lady. Where was this? This all wherever I stayed, always I was staying in New Osna, the same place. But one day, she was telling me something, and I got I got very scared to this. One thing about my life, I could never reveal or trust any Paul. I remember what my father said, and I knew, because when I would tell her and reveal who I was, I, I would endanger my life and her life, because it was very dangerous for them to to hide a Jew, you know, to, to, this was, that was not the right thing to do, and I would never, I would never trust her. But what happened, I was always suffering in silence. I could never reveal how I felt, what was, was living through, how I felt, nothing I could ever tell to nobody. Do you have any friends? But I have to, I forgot to tell something very important about my sister. You know, my sister, lived next to the Warsaw Ghetto, my younger sister. And I used to go to visit her all, very often. She lived next to the Warsaw Ghetto, and when I looked at her, I was always heartbroken. I seen these people in the world, and the Jewish people behind that nine foot brick wall and, and barbed wires in these places, and my heart went out for them. I, I knew how they suffered, how horrible life they had. And I've, I said to myself, I'm still a very lucky person. Then I also visited my other sister, my other uh, sister Nana, who had a very bad time. She was working for a policeman, and that policeman was a horrible person. He was abusing her, so actually terrible. When I came to her, she was telling me about it. I, I was devastated, I said to her, Nana, don't, you can stay no more in that place. I want you to leave that place immediately. I brought her to, my, to where I stayed with that lady. I brought her home to Mrs. Piasecka. And, and I told her, and, and, and I said to her, that lady, you know, I have to give her some money. She was very upset with me. She said, what do you mean you're giving her money? You hardly make any money. And you're giving her, you I said, I have to share with her because she's my cousin. She's struggling very much. She has a very hard time. She was struggling very much in Poland. She couldn't survive because the, because the, the, the Poles used to recognize her. She had a certain fear, a, a body language. I don't know what it was. She had a very horrible time of surviving in Poland. Then one day, after she came to visit me, she stand why, one day with me. The lady didn't like it. She didn't want her. Then I said, you know, then I, I, next day, I, there was like a Sunday. I went with her, we went to Warsaw. We walked in Warsaw on the street. It was, it, it, it was something like a, you know, like a miracle. Uh, God was looking for after my sister. And I, I got a good idea, I think. I have seen a tremendous sign writ written. Go with us, jedz z nami do Niemiec. Go with us to Germany. I told my sister, Nana, this is a ch chance of your lifetime. You can't, you have to take advantage of this chance because you have no, you can never, under no circumstances, survive in Poland. They recognize you. Poles recognize you more than German. Germans only recognize you that because they put that star of David on you and put you away in the ghettos, they recognize, don't you see, that's why they knew that the poor somehow recognized a Jew. I don't know, they never did me, luckily, but they did many. That's why. And I told her to walk, she walked in that, in that place, and she was scared to death. I said, I'm, she said, I'm scared. I said, don't be scared, I had to be brave. I said, I said, you have to be strong for yourself, and you have to do it. And I pushed her in with all my might, and walked in, and they began to interrogate her, and she walked out, she was the happiest in the world. She embraced me and kissed me and hugged me. She says, now I, I feel safe, I'm going to Germany. I said, that's right. I said, you're going to survive, that's happened. She went to Germany. I was correspondent, she really lived for my letters. I, I, live, I always write letters to her and I always send her some money. And she used to, and I was very grateful that she, she lived in Germany because she would never survive in that? Poland, that Nana. She always had a hard time in surviving. She had a very hard time. Going back, 
to the, my lady Piasetska when I was living with that lady. She told me one day, you know what happened, Yusha? Something very funny happened. I said, what happened? She said, they found a bunch of Jews. I said, Jews? They were hiding out, and now they're going to have to bury, they have to dig their own graves. When I heard it, I got shivers. I said, what? I said, what happened? She says, they found them. What do you think they found a bunch of Jews? What happened, what happened quite often? The Poles were hiding out the Jews. The Jews were giving the less possession they had. Whatever they owned, they gave it to them. And they're hiding them out. But after they didn't have nothing to give, they, they called up the Gestapo and he said, here that the Jews and gave them out. This is not the right thing to do, that's what they did. When she told me to do, I was terribly devastated. And I said to myself, how in the world can you trust the Poles? You can trust them, you can never reveal how you really feel. And I was always suffering in me because I was worrying, thinking about my father, how my father died, what happened, always suffering in silence, never to be able to reveal really my, my feeling about myself. After and, and stayed with that lady for a while, I heard that the, the Russians are closing in already. They're begin, beginning to uh, liberate different cities. Then I heard that Lublin is being, our city was liberated at the end of 1944. They were they're bombing the Katyusha, running, and we, and we were liberated. Then I heard that <coughs> Lublin is also being liberated. And, I, and, and somebody told me there were a lot of Jewish people already in Lublin. I said to myself, that's where I belong. I'm going to go to Lublin, but not as a Jew yet. I have to find out what's going on. I went, <coughs> I was very brave. I went to Lublin, and um, I walked in an employment office. And I said, I'd like to find a job, you know. My name is so-and-so, but I like to be a governess. I, I, I made, you know, <laughs> strides now. I, instead of being a maid, I became a governess. Since I raised the child so well, you know, I used to go, <coughs> when I was raising the child, I used always to go to church. I had to go with the child, the little baby, to church. But I was always scared to death because the priest, there was a small town, and the priest knew me. And I never used to go to confession. I said to him, oh, God, he may ask me, how come you don't come to confession? You are a Christian. You, why don't you confess? You should confess. But luckily, he never asked me. Never, nothing happened. Uh, going back uh, you know, I, uh, to the others, my other story, which I go from one place to another, that I found a wonderful job in Lublin. Mm -hmm. They found me a job. I work for a professor, a lovely, wonderful professor. He never knew I was Jewish. He was very nice to me. A very wonderful family. They lived like kings. I don't know how they could afford it. They lived at a beautiful home. All the conveniences, whatever you wanted to know. They had the best foods and had a beautiful little boy, a, a, a darling boy. And I was taking care of that boy. He was a very sweet boy. I don't know his name. He was an adorable boy. <coughs> and I was taking care of him. And these people liked me very, very much. He was so nice to me. Then, you know, I, was, I told them that I am to tell the same story. I said that I'm a patriot, and my father didn't want me to work for the Germans. I'm working better for the, you know, for the Polish people. He liked it very much. He was that nice to me that I said, you know, when I am born in Lodz, and I want to go back to Lodz, that he even let me, I was, you know, I went to school and learned how to type. He paid for me and let me do it, which was very, I think, very commendable of me. He was exceptionally very nice to me. And uh, <coughs> on Sundays, I supposed to go to church, but instead of going to church, I, I wanted to find out where the Jewish people are. I found the state, the state Jewish people stayed in a, sec a certain section. They, you know, they were already willing and dealing, God, God bless the Jews. I found some Jewish people and I was very happy. I befriended a guy, he was very nice. And I, I used to come there every Sunday. But I don't know, I didn't have too much security. I didn't, I still was hiding, I didn't want to reveal about, and I was somehow right. Because one day, 
when I was walking in the park with my little boy, there was a tremendous announcement on the loudspeakers. A terrible t thing happened. The, the <coughs> people who survived the Holocaust in guest chambers and, and death camps was a great pogrom in Kelce. They had, the Poles had a pogrom on the Jews. I said to myself, oh my God, how can I reveal that I'm a Jew? I can't do it yet. I am not sure with my life. I didn't want to do it. I still hiding out. I was still, you know, uh, lived in, with the same professor for a little while. Always scared. Always in my life, I was scared they're gonna, they're gonna, somebody's gonna recognize me and is gonna point to me that I am a Jew. But <coughs> I heard that the Lord is being liberated, and all of a sudden my sister came. She found me. She went to Mrs. Piasetska and she found me. And, and we decided to go to Lodz, to the city I was born in. We, we left that, in the, uh, that guy, uh, Mr. who I work with, the professor. We left that sp a place and I told him I have to go back home, you know, by my family. He was very receptive. And I learned how to, um, you know, how to type because I wanted to be independent. When I come, you know, back, I want to be an independent person. And uh, we went to, to Lodz. The first thing what we do when you go to your city, what do you do? You want to find out if anybody's alive. That's the main thing, important thing. I didn't know if my father was alive or my f anybody from my family. I, there was a, also a Jewish center. I walked in there and I asked him. I told him my name is Helena Drexler, and I'd like to know who survived from our family. He says, yes, there is a sister you, my sister Nana, thank God. I knew that she too. She is here. She's looking for you. And but nobody else. And I said, oh my God, my whole family perished in guest chambers. All, everybody perished in guest chambers. My father, my mother, my aunts, uncles, lot, lot and lot of people very tragically died a very horrible death. When you think about it, how terribly they died, I get very sad. That sad haunts me very much. How my parents, when they were put <laughs> in the guest chambers, how tragic they felt. On the top of each other, and after them, they put in crematorium. This sad haunts me very often. I can't forget it. But you can live in the past. You have, to li you have to go on with the future, which is very important. When uh, we uh, look for, you know, I found some of my friends when I back to Poland, and we, and I found my sister. We, we, were, we were very, very happy. We got all together, and we, uh, I found my a very wonderful friend of mine, and we, they had a beautiful home, and we all went together and we stayed in the home together and I found a wonderful job in Lodz. I had a beautiful job. I worked in a, in a very prominent Jewish... Um, I didn't work as a type, ty typist because it was not that... Uh, didn't make as much money. I was doing very well working in, in, in a big store. There was a wonderful big store, a big wholesale business, tremendous. All the Jewish people used to come there was a very lively place. Everybody used to come, used to meet everybody, which was, which was very, very nice. Can we take one break? One, one little break. I was working in that big city in, in, in Lodz. Okay. That's important. All and right. when is this? 1945. And liberation? I was liberated uh, in 40, late 44. Can you tell me about your liberation and 
have that happen? Not that much, because, you know, when I worked in Florida, that was not that much. What did you know about the liberation? How did you know liberation came? I, I didn't know exactly. I just told you how I know, because when they liberated, I, 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 I felt liberated when I came to, to Lodge, then I knew that I was liberated, because I met all my, I, liber I met everybody from my city, you know, not, um, my sisters I, uh, I met, and my people I left, that's when I lived. When I met people, I'm not, I'm, I'm the, when I met people in Lublin, remember? Then these people, we were liberated. Don't you see? That's a different like he was in camp. This was different. Did you? That's different. What was it like for you after liberation, after you were back? What happened when I came to Vlog? It was wonderful. You I told you I was working, I was very glad, but... Could you practice Judaism? Yeah, but I didn't want to stay in Poland. I never associated with non-Jews that time, never. But I was, uh, you know, practiced Judaism. And I was not religious, but we, you know, what we, 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 are, we are working, we are trying to get out of Poland. That's my... I have to tell you what happened. See, my father told us that we, I never forgot what my father, father told us. He told us that when I survived the war, I should get in touch with my aunts, right? And it never escaped. I remembered it. When I was working, I put that was... Go ahead. How are you doing? She's very fine. <coughs> and when I was working uh, in the big, uh, the name of the big wholesale place, was uh, we th that place that from uh, everything in we had there it was a very luxurious store. We had dates and nuts and chocolate. That was after the war was, was a luxury, and I was very lucky to work there. And I met a lot of people there. But I, and my sister also was working there. I, w I had a big job, but she had a small job. <laughs> she was selling, I think, ice cream. She met her her husband, Alan. She met the Alan in that store. Riviera, the name of the Riviera. But I, uh, I didn't feel that wonderful in Poland because I knew that Poland is uh, uh, like a prison without bars. You can't get out of Poland. Yeah. In order to, to leave, you can leave Poland. And I remember one thing very well. It never escaped my mind, what my father told me. He said, when you survive the war, you, you put an ad in the paper, in the Jewish paper, and tell that you are alive. That's exactly what I did. I put an ad in a forward paper in Lodz. Then they told me how to do it. And I wrote in that paper that the daughters of Solomon and Regina Drexler are alive. Like miracle of miracles, after a week, I received a telegram. It was the most wonderful thing in this world. My aunt read the foreword because they, you know, they, they, are, they used to speak Yiddish at home very much, more than I did. And they read that letter and they were overjoyed and, and, and they wrote me and, uh, a telegram, they sent a telegram to, to us and told me that we don't, don't worry anymore, we're going to help you out and we're going to take you to Canada. The only thing I worried about now, how do I get out from that? I didn't want to stay in Poland anymore. I had some friends and boyfriends. I didn't want to bother. I had somebody I remember I dated, was handsome and lovely, but he was a great communist. I said, who is a communist? He said, he said, you know, I like marry you, but you, you have to stay in Poland. I said, never in this world I stay in Poland. Under no circumstance, he was handsome, and, but he was working. He was a communist, a real communist. Who needs him? I didn't want him. Uh, I decided my only alternative now is to get out. And my uh, brother-in-law, Alan, he knew some people, but he was, you know, he was, uh, he was in business some, and he knew some people, and they helped me to get out of, of Poland. My sister, my and Halina left, and Nana and me, we went. We we went on a small boat, smuggled out from Poland at night. Luckily, we came. Where did we go? They told us the only place to go is to go to a DP camp. 
I went to Berlin, Schlachtensee, and I went to the DP camp. The Jewish people have no place to go. Nobody needed them, nobody, even <coughs> after all these atro atrocities committed against the Jews, the Jews had no place to go. Very plain and simple. Some people went to Palestine. They had to smuggle to Palestine, but it was not an easy road. But the majority had no place to go unless they had some families who gave them affidavit or visa, then they could come. But otherwise, they had very strict quotas. They couldn't go. But I was very lucky. That means I, I knew that in order to get out, we have to go to Germany. I, I, was, I went to the DP camp in, in, in Berlin Schlachtensee, which is a very, a very big camp. Uh, originally, it was a military, German military camp. My sister and I, we stayed in one room. Again, poverty. And we slept in, in one cut, you know, the military cuts, and covered myself, myself only with a green blanket. That was the way it was. And we lived only on the rations we got from the UNRWA. That's all we lived on. And uh, we got some help from the joint distribution, but mostly of UNRWA. And the times were not very good. And I, right away, I like always to be independent. I went to work. I was working in in uh, in Bekleidungsamt and then Eskarte and working in different compass in office. I was working, always working, doing. My sister, unfortunately, could never work. Somehow, she didn't function that well. She stayed home, and I was the provider. And we stayed, and uh, there it was. It was a a, a big camp. It's a lot of people. A, a lot of thinking. Things are going on in that camp. As a matter of fact, they even erected a big monument in the memory of the six million. They had, you know, they had um, people used to go to um, uh, from. I used to go to movies. I used to go. I always Jewish people love culture. Whenever they as 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 soon as they breathe, they love culture. They love to go to movies. They like to to see it. That's, that's what Jews are all about. I used to go out, you know, go to, in Berlin, I used to go to the movies, the theaters. I was very poor, but I make sure that I went for that. There used to be a nice life, They're not, not, ter not terribly bad, except for one thing. We didn't have that much food. I didn't have enough meat. I only lived on the Russians, that was not that much. But I knew that uh, I have something, I have a lot of hope, I have something look, to look forward to. And I was, I was not complaining. I uh, stayed in Berlin, Schlachtensee, until 1948. 1948, uh, the Russians made a blockade on Berlin. They couldn't get out, they couldn't get in. What happened, the day the Americans, we were in the American zone, that the Americans had to liquidate our camp, the DP camp, and they had to evacuate us to another uh, American camp, to another city, also to a DP camp. I remember it was for the first time in my life I flew in a plane. <laughs> and there were some handsome Americans there sitting there. And, and I met some gorgeous Americans, the flyers. You know. There was a very, you know, uh, and I was very grateful and went on a plane and took us to another DP camp by the name of Fernwald Camp which was you know, even worse than this one, because they had to put so many more people in it. It was, it was not a picnic there, but it was the same, and I, 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 I was also working there. And I, was, uh, I stayed there, and I survived. I stayed there, and, and in the meantime, I kept in touch with my aunt all the time, kept in touch with her, wrote letters to her back and forth, and she was always giving us hope that we shouldn't worry, that we're going to be all right, that, that we're going to eventually come. And it, we stayed in, I stayed in the DP camp until 1949. 1949, July, was a wonderful day in our lives, my sister and I. We got the visa to go to Toronto, Canada. That was wonderful, because when I lived in Germany, or I lived in Poland, Poland I never felt free. Never felt free. But when we went to, to Toronto, 
first we, we got out in Quebec, and that from Quebec went to Toronto, that uh, the, the sunshine, you know, I felt like I am a newborn person, I am a free person. I felt wonderful when I came to Toronto. I met my aunt, was, which was wonderful to us, and had two sons. She st we stayed with her for a month or so. I met my good-looking uh, cousins. I, had a, uh, I liked them a lot. They were lovely guys, and my aunt treated us very, very good. My, uh, and we stayed with her, and she didn't let us work. She told her, you have to rest up, and, you know, you lived so much through. But after that, after a month or so, I be, we decided that we have to go to work. We can just, I would never think of anything like that. And my other great priority in my life is to learn the language. Because a person, you have to know the language of the country. You can stay in a, in a, in a country without knowing the language. I went to school uh, and, I t and I learned the language. I, st you know, I tried my best because it's terribly important. I couldn't stand it. When, s when people were sitting around me and they were talking and I could not, I didn't know what they were talking about. That was, you know, was not very, I didn't appreciate it. We, I stayed in, uh, in, in Toronto with my aunt and I worked for, you know, diff in different places. Then I, I forgot to mention something important. Um, my husband, I met my husband at my sister's wedding. So, when we were lived in Germany, I met him there, and, uh, and she had the wedding, and I met him there, and we, we kept corresponding. He went to America, and I went to Toronto. But when, I, when he came to America in 1949, he came to visit me also, to, you know, to Toronto. He visited me, and we kept in touch. And we liked each other. And in, in 1952, I came to visit my, my sister here to Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. And we got married a very short time. It was a very uh, quick wedding because I had a permission just to stay for a week. And we decided <laughs> to get married. It was a very quick, uh, a very quick wedding. It has to be done very fast. We got married. and. Uh, we had a wonderful family. I am very grateful to this country because uh, I, I, am f I have a freedom and uh, I, I, I built it in spite of all, all my experiences. I built a normal life and I, have, uh, I raised wonderful children. I, I gave them education, which is a greatest investment you can do. And I am forever grateful to this country for giving me the opportunity of this. I never, I never take anything for granted. I'm also, I'm all, and my son is a lawyer, very successful. He is, uh, he is a bachelor, as he is 37 years old, and I have a, a wonderful daughter who lives in Cleveland, Ohio. She's married. She is a precious uh, a, a, a granddaughter, I mean, a little daughter. Her name is Rachel, and she's expecting another baby. Which is, which is very wonderful to me. I'd like to mention also something which m means a lot to me. I think it means a lot to every Jew is Israel. I think Israel is very dear to every Jew, es especially to Holocaust survivors. Because I know deep in my heart, when we have it, would have Israel in 1939, six million Jews would never perish because we would have a place to go, a place to be Nobody want to turn, b nobody want to bring the Jews in. And Israel is very important in, 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 in the Jewish, in our lives. In 1981 was a gathering of all the Holocaust survivors. And I took my whole family. That was an unforgettable experience to me because I went with my children and they could know because they could appreciate and they could know what I li learn about our experiences and learn wh what we went through and at the same time they can appreciate the beauty of our victory Bec what we, s we survive the, the biggest atrocities of, of the world and we have to know one more thing that we 
have to remember I am leaving my children a very painful legacy, but I hope and pray they're never going to forget it. Because when you forget the history, you're doomed to repeat it. And when one justice is done to one people, it's done to all peoples. People should always remember, because the German started the war with the Jews. But later on, when, when, when be, he, Hitler began to lose the war, he even discriminate against his own people. He discriminated, he only was trying to create a race with blonde hair and blue eyes. And when some Germans had red hair, he discriminated against them. That's why we have to know that we have to be aware of any injustices in the world. And I think this is very important. We have to treasure Israel and Shalom. How long did I speak? Could you tell us a little bit about the pictures that you have? And, uh, this picture is of um, Mrs. Piasetska. Her name is Piasetska. I was working for that lady. She was a gentle lady, and she was wonderful, a very fine, a wonderful person. She treated me exceptionally well, and I was taking care of her little she stands, she is here with her baby. Mm -hmm. And the back of the, of the photograph, she says to me, Miwa, dear, dear Nusha. She liked me very much, and uh, she wished me good luck. She knew I told her that I'm going away to my parents. This is the baby I raised for her. She was a, a precious little baby, and, and she entrusted me that baby. I used to take the baby to church, all, all of her. She was a wonderful lady, but I never told her about uh, that I'm Jewish. I never revealed my identity to her. Is it okay? Hmm? Oh, it's down. Tip it uh, up just a little bit for me, would you? Which one? That is fine. Oh, not lift it up, but back where it was. There you go, right. Hold it right there. Oh. Turn it down just a little bit. There you go. That's perfect. A little bit uh, the other way. Just touch my. Oh, right there. Hold it right there. I don't see them. Who is it? I know that. I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit about these new pictures? That picture is, is a picture of my wonderful family. My mother is right here. This is her sister, Hela, and this is her, her brother, Mendel, and this is her other sister, Esther, and this is my grandfather. All that wonderful family perished so innocently in the Holocaust. None of them are alive, unfortunately. Thank you.